Dialogue Weekend. U.S. first quarter GDP contracts 4.8%, the largest drop since late 2008. How long will the economic downturn last? U.S. Secretary of State accuses Beijing of interfering in Hong Kong affairs, saying the U.S. government will closely monitor events. And this week's Newsmaker, now on Dialogue Weekend. Welcome to this edition of Dialogue Weekend. I'm Xu Qianduo. With most commercial establishments in the U.S. closed and unemployment skyrocketing, the U.S. economy has shrunk by nearly 5% in the first quarter of 2020. It's the deepest downturn in the world's biggest economy since the 2008 global financial crisis. As the epidemic continues to undermine the economy, what is the outlook for American jobs and incomes? Joining me via Skype is Professor Jeffrey Sachs, Director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. Welcome to our show, Professor. Thank you very much. Good evening to you. Good evening. So according to U.S. Labor Department data released Thursday, another 3.84 million American workers filed for unemployment benefit last week, taking the total past 30 million in the last six weeks. Layoffs accelerated in April, and economists expect the unemployment rate to surge into double digits with the release of the next employment figures in about a week's time. In your opinion, so what is the worst case scenario for the U.S. job market in the short term? I think that uh, we will have unemployment rates uh, 15 to 20 percent of the workforce uh, very, very shortly. And it will take a long time for that to uh, heal. So we're going to have mass unemployment. And we're going to have a continuing uh, economic downturn, which uh, definitely will last uh, into later this year. It's a very, very serious disruption of the U.S. economy, obviously. And we're not going to have a V-shaped recovery where the downturn is followed by a quick upturn because uh, the disease continues to transmit in large numbers in the United States. It's not under control, and it's not likely to come under control, unfortunately, anytime soon. The policies uh, pursued by the federal government have been confused, indecisive, and in the end, leaving things to states and cities that really are not equipped adequately to control the epidemic. So we're going to have a continuing number of cases and a continuing economic crisis, I'm afraid, for several months to come. Mm -hmm. So how are people's daily lives are being affected, uh, in particular the most vulnerable, uh, vulnerable group of people, uh, since we're talking about the unemployment here? It's a really a terrible mess. Uh, of course, uh, as you point out, 30 million people have applied for unemployment. The systems uh, for being uh, paid the unemployment compensation in principle exist, but in practice are not really equipped for such large surges of numbers. So many, many people have not received unemployment compensation for uh, many uh, weeks. Uh, they are struggling. Uh, people are not paying rents uh, because they can't afford to. Uh, people are using debt on their credit cards. And this means, uh, of course, uh, uh, a lot of uh, worry and anxiety in the society, a lot of difficulties. And uh, the people who have been laid off, by and large, are people working in shops uh, or in services uh, that don't make a lot of money to begin with. Uh, and in the United States, when you lose your job, uh, you also lose your health care. Mm -hmm. So this is a cascade of terrible problems that are not going to be addressed anytime soon because the U.S. is a very complicated uh, place and it's not well governed. Uh, at the federal level, so we don't have any uh, smart solutions that come at the national scale. 
Mm -hmm. Well, not paying rent. Uh, let's take a look at these retailers in the U.S. Uh, you know, American retailers have been hit hard by COVID-19, with many states still under lockdown and the customers staying at home. So sales are down sharply, but that's understandable. You're leaving many retailers unable to pay the rent. You know, some have even stopped paying at all. So what is the U.S. government doing? I mean, to help struggling retailers. The U.S. Uh, federal government uh, has already spent uh, almost three trillion dollars, uh, more than two trillion, and the numbers keep rising as a short-term uh, stopgap measures. Uh, this is uh, a lot of money, but it's been uh, very uh, unsystematic, I would say, uh, and so there is a lot of complaint and a lot of confusion. The, the truth is, with an epidemic like this, and China saw it also, the economy closes down during the period of the disease transmission. And so the only real solution is to get the epidemic under control. So if the uh, virus continues to transmit in large numbers, there really is no chance for a normal economic recovery. In this sense, uh, public health becomes economic policy, or public health becomes economic health. And uh, we hope that China has uh, really stopped the transmission. That's what it seems to be the case. And boy, I really hope that this is the case for the sake of China and for the world. But in the United States, this has not happened. And some of the states that say that they are reopening for business still have a big epidemic underway. Well. People will get sick, people will die. Uh, of course, consumers uh, will be afraid, uh, as they should be, and probably there will have to be another lockdown after that. So this is the real problem in the United States. Our federal government, our national government, is not functional. Uh, it, is, uh, it puts money, but it doesn't put solutions. It doesn't stop the disease. And then President Trump said, well, that's the responsibility of governors and mayors, which is ridiculous in my opinion, uh, because how can you have 50 governors and thousands of mayors doing this one by one rather than a national policy? But that's what happened in the United States. So we're getting waves of the disease, and as a result of that, we can't really reopen the economy. Even some of our supply chains, uh, like uh, meat production, are under tremendous stress right now because the workers are getting sick and we have uh, meat uh, processing plants that close down. And then the federal government said, well, you have to reopen them, but the workers are sick. Mm -hmm. uh, there are big infections in the very places that produce the chicken and the beef for the American consumers. So this is really a terrible mess. It shows why government is so important and uh, why when you don't have good policies, uh, you can't make the economy recover. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned about, uh, you know, the government has injected the trillions of dollars into the economy, but still we are seeing a contraction of the economy. So how is that so? So what's your solution? What do you think the best way to resolve the current uh, impasse, let's say? Well, one thing to uh, make clear, the minus 5%, uh, which you mentioned uh, at the top of the show, uh, is for the first quarter. But the United States only locked down the economy in the second, uh, two, in the last two weeks of March, which means that we're going to have a much bigger downturn in the second quarter of the year, April, May, and June. Uh, the U.S. economy will fall far more uh, than it fell in the first quarter. Uh, we won't have stability. Probably we'll have continuing declines in the third quarter as well. And uh, this is uh, really uh, meaning that all of the money going in may end up paying some wages uh, in the short term or covering unemployment compensation, but it won't really lead to a recovery. The only chance for recovery is to stop the virus. Uh, it is to contain the virus. And that requires public health measures of uh, testing, isolating people, 
uh, quarantining people, tracing contacts, uh, using good public health to stop each cluster of new transmission. China has done that. Uh, Korea has done that. Australia and New Zealand. Vietnam has done that. So many countries uh, in uh, the region uh, of China, in the Asia Pacific, including China and other countries, uh, don't have ongoing large epidemics. We hope that it's really stopped. Of course, there will probably be still new some uh, new cases, but not at a widespread basis. But in the United States, it has not stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, it continues to transmit. And until that is controlled, I'm afraid that the economic crisis will deepen and there will be more uh, debt crisis because unpaid bills, unpaid rents, credit card debt, household debt, federal debt, uh, our budget deficit will be probably 20% of our national income this year, of course, a, a world record. Uh, and so we will have a, a huge cleaning up to do, but the longer the virus transmits, the worse will be the economics. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, well explained. Uh, if you look at the uh, the stock market, uh, we have some of the shares, you know, rising or remaining stable despite the weakness in economy. How is that? Uh, how do you explain this disconnect <laughs> between the real economy and the stock market? Yeah, I think that there are uh, maybe uh, three explanations. One is that the Federal Reserve pumps a lot of money, a lot of liquidity into the economy. The interest rates are zero, basically. The Federal Reserve buys lots of uh, debt. It buys lots of uh, junk bonds now. Uh, uh, it buys lots of federal debt. And because the interest rates are so low, uh, people take the liquidity and put it into the stock market. So one part of it is the monetary policy. Uh, a second part is that some companies are doing relatively better uh, in this because uh, companies e-commerce companies like Amazon uh, or Walmart uh, uh, that uh, have a big e-commerce component or have a big uh, retail component that actually grows during this period uh, are hiring workers and that has been part of it. But I think the third part is confusion by uh, investors because uh, we hear uh, every day in the U.S., oh, uh, we're going to open up now, the crisis is over, or there's some new drug that's going to solve it, uh, or some rumor about the vaccine. To my mind, uh, this is a little naive. Uh, so I think the uh, stock market fell first, and then it recovered uh, quite a bit uh, in uh, for several weeks, but I think probably too much too much optimism and not enough realism about the state of uh, affairs in the United States. It's rather mixed up, and I'm worried uh, that the stock market could uh, continue to decline, that it has been unrealistic in expecting a very quick recovery. Well, thank you, Professor. Well, even as the U.S. struggles with the pandemic and the economic downturn, the Trump administration and in particular Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has made time to focus on China's Hong Kong, claiming that a proposed national security legislation will impact the city's local and overseas investment. Does such a claim have any basis? And what's the situation in Hong Kong now as they fear the resurgence of violence or large-scale violence failed to materialize on Friday. So joining me via satellite is uh, Hong Wei Min, Hong Kong deputy to the 13th National People's Congress. Welcome to our show, Mr. Wei. Hello. Well, speaking at a press conference yes. this week, uh, U.S. Secretary of State Michael Pompeo touched upon national security legislation effects in Hong Kong. Uh, for those who might not that familiar with the situation in Hong Kong, he was referring to the Article 23 of Hong Kong's basic law. Basic law is considered to be the Hong Kong SAR's effective constitution. So what is Article 23? Can you explain a, a, little, a little bit to us? Okay, yeah. Uh, Article 23 of the basic law basically said Hong Kong SAR should 
you know, make its own legislation on the part of uh, the prevention or subvention uh, against the central people's government, you know, basically it is a constitutional duty of the Hong Kong SAL to enact, to make its own legislature, uh, le legislation on this Article 23. Now, if you think about it, we have been back, uh, you know, since 97, it's more than 20 years since the past, and also it's more than, well, 30 years since the, uh, uh, the basic law was passed. We have not still make, you know, performed this duty. So, it is very obvious uh, what's happened last year, the, the social unrest and everything, people rethink that we need this legislation, which is why uh, there are various voices from the society requesting the Hong Kong SAL government to uh, start the legislation of Article 23 again. Mm -hmm. And oh. I really think uh, w whether it will affect, affect the local uh, and overseas investment, my view is the lack of which will actually affect, because that means that Hong Kong is unprotected. Hong Kong. Uh, like most places, most countries or, or regions, they have their own legislation on national security, where Hong Kong, this thing is missing. So when people invest in Hong Kong, people will rethink. Um, in the past, maybe people did not, did not pay a lot of attention to it, but now with the social unrest and also with the growing tension, international um, tension, people will rethink, should I invest in Hong Kong where there is no protection of national security? Well, exactly. Last year, we, uh, we saw this uh, large-scale violence uh, and riot, uh, uh, you know, basically drove a lot of uh, business owners giving up uh, their uh, stores, for example, and going back to their own country. So that's a problem. That's probably, you know, that's the reason why there's a lack of confidence, not the opposite. But anyway, Pompeo's remarks exactly. uh, came after the release of a letter by a group of U.S. lawmakers on the recent arrest of uh, uh, those involved in the riots last year, they are urging Pompeo to take Article 23 into consideration in the annual U.S. assessment of Hong Kong's autonomy. So Hong Kong takes pride in itself on the rule of law. If anyone breaks the law, of course, you will be held accountable. Now you have the U.S. basically threatening to reassess Hong Kong's autonomy by factoring in legal recommend, uh, amend, uh, amendments to the basic law. Isn't this clear interference in Hong Kong's internal affairs? Yes, it is. Uh, in fact, if you think about it, as everybody knows that Article 23 was in the basic law, you know, before the Hong Kong, the formation of the Hong Kong SAR. So both the U.S. government and every people in Hong Kong knows about it. And right now, a foreign government tried to interfere and say, oh, you shouldn't make this legislation. That is just purely interference of basically China and Hong Kong's internal affairs. Uh, we know for sure, I mean, Hong Kong has been pride, uh, take, take pride in the rule of law. Uh, we have seen some worries of what happened last year that people beginning to think, was, will, are we still one of the best you know, places for rule of law? But, and the reason, reason arrest of those people, I think, is actually a proof that no matter who you are, if you break the law, Justice may come late, but it's not missing. Mm -hmm. Well, recently, the liaison office of the Central People's Government in the Hong Kong SAR has uh, expressed the concern that the prolonged paralysis of the House Committee of the Legislative Council hinders the performance of legislative functions under basic law. So tell us, you know, what paralysis here are we talking about? This happens to uh, a certain legislator, uh, Mr. Dennis Kwok, I, I happen to know him in the gym. Um, he has been uh, temporarily chairing this internal committee of the Legislative Council ever since uh, October last year, so that it, it can elect its uh, you know, chairman. But six months has passed, and they still have not elected a chairman of the internal uh, committee of the Legislature Council, which is the most important committee uh, of the Council. Now, um, where, uh, you know, Beijing and uh, local liaison officer, uh, office of uh, Chinese officials had, uh, you know, voiced out their concern and in fact, in fact criticism, because this actually basically paralyzed the legislation uh, process of the whole Legislative Council. Uh, and that not only affects the local Hong Kong internal affairs, but also affects, uh, for example, there is a um, legi pending legislation on the national flag. 
And that one is clearly a relationship between the Hong Kong SAR and the central government, and it's that, that is purely under the, the responsibility of the central government. So uh, what I see is this is not a change in the one country, two system, but in fact the um, two offices, the uh, Hong Kong Macau office and the uh, central government uh, liaison office in Hong Kong, exercising their duty as the specialized department or specialized office of the um, of state council to on, on Hong Kong affairs. Mm -hmm. Well, it has been more than a week since uh, China's state council appointed new secretaries for five bureaus of the Hong Kong SAR government. Uh, so have the new appointments um, made a difference yet? And how do you evaluate this latest reshuffle of the cabinet of the government in Hong Kong? Uh, well, I, I'm sure, I mean, we won't see the effect in a week. Um, uh, five bureaus, uh, four new secretaries, uh, because one of them was been tr has been transferred. Um, I can see that the SA government and the chief, chief executive is trying to focus on how to revitalize the local economy. If you look at two of the new appointees, one is for the Finance Services and Treasury Bureau, and the other one is for the uh, Innovation and Technology Bureau. And these are the two major growing engines of Hong Kong, should we pass the epidemic uh, right now. So um, injecting um, you know, new secretaries, uh, hoping um, they can lead Hong Kong out of the current financial uh, crisis, I think is probably the, the reason behind where uh, the chief executive had nominated such new secretaries. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a look at the latest situation. You know, yesterday, basically, the uh, Friday, uh, the May Day holiday, there was, uh, before that, uh, there is the concern that uh, there will be a resurgence of violence. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, that failed to realize at least that there was no large scale, although there is, there is I mean, petrol bombs being thrown upon others. So, wh what's your assessment of the situation now? I think um, there has been uh, several, several attempts of the opposition or of the, the, the mobs try to re-issue um, this kind call, uh, you know, this kind of violence inside shopping malls. Uh, in fact, last Sunday they already did it, uh, in actually in where I live, <laughs> exactly the, the Taikushing, the, the mall. And then um, they tried to do it again uh, yesterday. Uh, I can see the number of people attending such uh, violence uh, has significantly decreased. Okay, if you look at um, you know last year, uh, let's say um, um, November, uh, we're talking about a thousand, a thousand to five hundred people, you know, on the street, um, you know, uh, throwing stones and some of them petrol bombs. Right now we're talking about a hundred plus, okay, less than two hundred. Okay, and then also they are, I, I would say to a certain extent, less violence as well uh, compared with last year. I think the overall society um, right now there is a tendency saying now we are already in a, under the epidemic, we are already under a financial crisis. You know, our shops has been closed for a long time because of the government restrictions, and then. Just when we're feeling getting better, just when we're having, you know, five days of consecutively n zero new cases, and the shops are beginning to open and people start to go on shops again, why should people, these people go in and start violence in the shopping mall? It just makes no sense. So uh, I can see that is, even though there's still obviously in the media, there's still some supporters for such violences, overall society has you know, really turn, you know, very, very um, cool, co very cold on this um, particular request. Mm -hmm. A turn of attitudes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us here. Well, let's leave it there for now and take a look at this week's Newsmaker. <laughs> Joining me now via Skype is Dr. Kate Tulenko, CEO of U.S.-based uh, Covers Health. And, well, Dr. Richard Houghton, editor-in-chief of, uh, uh, of the prominent British medical journal The Lancet, recently appeared in the Financial Times as well as on our sister Chinese language broadcaster CCTV, the most influential TV station in China. So briefly, 
Can you tell us you know, who he is and uh, what about him impresses you? So, uh, yeah, Richard Horton is, as you said, the editor-in-chief of, of Lancet, and he is a very knowledgeable person, very influential, uh, and has a long history of actually making good early calls of what's going to happen in public health and, and global health. And so what he's come out saying is that most people, most governments knew at the end of January how bad the pandemic was, like what the situation was in, in China. And there there is some, I, I think this sort of... Um, uh, sort of disagreements on all sides because on one hand it's clear that many governments did not act as quickly as they, they should have. For example, the U.S. government, Italy, Spain, whereas the other governments such as South Korea and um, New Zealand did act quickly enough. But also there have been claims by the U.S. CDC and the World Health Organization that they didn't have the access they needed in China to, to certain scientists or institutions or data. So, so the, the question of whether the whole world knew what they needed to know at the end of January it really is, is unclear. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, according to the Lancet, at least, they you know, said that you know, between January 24th and the 31st, so there was a mountain daily evidence and that COVID-19 was becoming a, pandem a pandemic. That's according to Dr. Houghton. He also said the world knew the extent of the threat at the first by the last week of January, but that many countries still allowed the whole of February and early March to pass before acting. So inaction here, do you agree with him? There's inaction probably is a key problem with some of the countries. I think that many people see February as a lost month, that, that many countries could have taken actions uh, in February that they did not and ended up with um, worse outbreaks as a result. And in fact, when reporters asked President Trump what his administration had done in February, he was not able to, to point to any significant concrete actions. So, so it does indeed seem that in, in many countries, including the U.S., February was a lost month. And, and it's an important reinforcer how in an epidemic every day matters like there are no weekends in an outbreak you have to constantly be assessing the situation and, and making the sort of the, the most cost-effective decisions even though these decisions are often quite difficult to make that's true well in the interview with uh, FT Houghton says you know Western countries have uh, fared poorly in their response to the coronavirus compared to Asian countries because they saw the threat through the lens of the common cold, while people in Asia feared a rerun of SARS, which is much more deadly. So he concluded that the cognitive uh, bias uh, cost some countries dearly, like the U.S. and the U.K. So what's your opinion on that? Yes, I think that makes sense. As you point out, Asian countries had experience with SARS as well as the, the MERS outbreak that had occurred in South Korea as well. So they knew how bad it could be, how disruptive it could be, that even a disease that only kills 1% of people can, can completely disrupt society. Whereas the, the U.S. hasn't been, in other countries, haven't been severely affected um, by diseases like that before. So yes, I, I, I do agree with that. Mm -hmm. Well, in the interview with the CCTV, you know, Dr. Houghton also said you know, he regrets that the COVID-19 pandemic has been politicized. This has led to the spread of conspiracy theories and even campaign of disinformation. So the New York Times reported that the Trump administration has pressed the intelligence community to link the lab in, a lab in Wuhan to the virus. Amid such confusion and politics, what should the scientists do to help the public see a clearer picture? Yeah, that's a, a big challenge. I mean, certainly one thing that this pandemic ha has revealed is the, the, the politicization of, of public health. And I think that one potential response to it that can be done now, but also more importantly in the future, is that public health champions and public health institutions need to identify champions for public health in every political Sorry, party yeah. Running at the short national of time. and the state level. Yeah. With that, we are coming to the end of today's show. Uh, many thanks to Professor Jeffrey Sachs, Mr. Hong Wei-Ming, and Dr. Kate Tulanko. You can also watch us on the CGTN app or on YouTube. I'm Xu Qianzhu. You can find me on Twitter at Xu Qianzhu. Thank you for watching. See you next week.